Uh, if you have your Bible, Matthew 18 and Matthew 19 today, you'll see it on the screen if you didn't bring a Bible with you. But we're talking about dealing with change, and all of us have to deal with change. As life goes on, life changes. And if you don't like change, just get out now. It's going to come, right? And people say, I don't like change. Well, whether you like it or not, God really doesn't care. That's not the way he created this world. We're always going to be changing, and dealing with change is one of those things we have to get good at, or we're going to be miserable the rest of our lives, right? So today we're talking about dealing with change when change is a necessity out of Matthew chapter 18, 1 through 9, and Matthew chapter 19, 13 through 15. Actually, I just want to read six verses out of chapter 8. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What world figure proclaimed himself the greatest? Remember? Muhammad Ali. I am the greatest. He said, if you ever dream that you're going to whip me, you better go back to sleep. Right? I am the greatest. Well, Ali was just, uh, he was loose. He's a loose cannon. He was loose enough to say that. He was uh, the greatest on the stage in his day. But the disciples came to Jesus, and they want to know as a religious person, uh, who, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I mean, we've all left our boats, and, uh, and we're starting to follow you. Which one of us do you think is going to be number one? Uh, which one you, who do you think is going to succeed? Well, that was the wrong question to ask Jesus. He called a little child to him, and he placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like what? This little child. Now, he's not talking about childish behavior. He's talking about something much deeper than that. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus uses something that an English teacher would never use, a double negative. You will not never enter the kingdom of heaven, he said. Let me just nail this down. You'll not make it. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. If you cause a little child who believes in me to stumble... People spend entire careers studying scriptural manuscripts, studying who Jesus was, authenticating archaeological finds. People earn advanced degrees trying to determine if they can better understand God, Jesus, and the Bible. And Jesus says to his disciples, no, let me tell you something. Unless you become like a little child, you're not even going to enter the kingdom. So, being a part of the kingdom of God is much more than intelligence. It's much more than maturity in terms of age. Unless you become like these little children. And then in chapter 19, people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. And he pray and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And when he placed his hands on them, he went on from there. These little children, he said, believe in me. How much could a little child know about Jesus? But they believe in me. You think they heard it at the house? They think they heard it in the village? You think little kids sometimes just sort of nibble around the edges of adult conversation? You know how that is. They hear stuff they ought not hear. Do you think that's where they knew about him? He said, I'll tell you something. The kingdom of heaven, the place where God rules and works, belongs to the little children. Well, what was he saying here? I read a letter not long ago. A child wrote to God, Dear God, my grandpa says you were around when he was a kid. How far back do you go? 
little kids. Now, the question that prompted the discussion was, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus changed that question and says, how does one enter the kingdom? He says to his disciples, unless they change or turn, unless they turn and become like little children, they will never enter the kingdom. So change is at the heart of what it means to become one of God's children. Change runs up against stubbornness. Change runs up against knowledge. Change runs up against determination. People say, if I can just know enough to settle these spiritual questions. And Jesus said, well, no, that's not really it. Unless you change, you're not going to know the answer to these spiritual questions because change is at the heart of the Christian faith. Change which is personal and change which is dynamic. In our churches, we talk about a person being converted, changed, converted, and that's a good biblical word, to convert. Many denominational groups talk about confirmation. A child is born into a family, that child is baptized into the fellowship of the church as as an infant, early Christian history. Later on, that child goes through catechism or teachings, learning about the church, about the Bible, about God, about Jesus. They reach an age where they go to a confirmation class. And in that confirmation class, they confirm, they agree to those teachings. That's called confirmation. Maybe a change, maybe not a change. But at least an agreement that I've heard these teachings, I agree with them. Jesus never talked about confirmation. He talked about doing the will of God. But Jesus talked about change, conversion. When someone turns, when someone who's been walking away from the kingdom turns and walks into the kingdom. That's what he's talking about here, change which is dynamic. In 1966, a uh, retrospective of Picasso's paintings were exhibited in Cannes, France. Hundreds of his works graced the walls of the gallery, beginning with the first ones he painted, all the way to the ones he had painted as recently as 85 years of age. A woman came to Picasso in the hallway, and she said to him, I don't understand over there. The beginning pictures are so serious and so solemn and so mature. Then the later ones are so different. They're so youthful, and they're so irrepressible. It almost seems as though the dates on those pictures should have been reversed. How do you explain it? Picasso looked at the lady and said easily, It takes a long time to become young. It takes a long time to become young. And Jesus looked at these older disciples, and he brought that little child, those little children in there, and he said to them, let me tell you something. You may have lived a while, but it's going to take something for you to become young enough to trust, to turn, to change. And unless you do that, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, what kind of change was he talking about here? Obviously, the disciples were headed in the wrong direction. And they they evidenced that by saying, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, you're going in the wrong direction. You're thinking about earthly power, how governments operate, how businesses operate, how sports operate. You're thinking in terms of an earthly power of dominion. Uh, You're thinking about being able to have control over others. You're thinking about having influence, of being someone, of having a self-image that is a self-image of being in power. That's not the kingdom, he said. You're going in the wrong direction. You're moving away from the kingdom. You need to turn around and move toward the kingdom of God. In Acts 3.19, Peter preached, repent then and turn to God. Repent means to turn around. 
and turn to God and become a person of faith and trust, that times of refreshing may come to the Lord, from the Lord. So Peter, preaching about Jesus Christ, said, unless you turn toward him, you're never going to sense that there's something new happening in your life. Refreshing, that's what he's talking about. When you have your sins forgiven and you feel like you've been born again, Jesus said, you will never, no, never enter the kingdom of heaven. What kind of change is he talking about? What what has to change with us? Well, the first thing that has to change is our sense of self-sufficiency. I pull myself up by my bootstraps. I deserve what I have because I earned it on my own. I am a self-sufficient person. And as you go through life, you understand that life begins to deal you some pretty hard, tough hands that you can't handle, and you're not as self-sufficient as you thought you were. Jesus said that has to change. If you want to be in the kingdom of God, you've got to change from self-sufficiency to dependency, to being like a little child. And he uses that child as an example of being dependent, of being humble. Two ways, two characteristics of coming into the kingdom. The child depended on someone else, someone older, someone wiser to meet his needs. Coming into the kingdom of God is never about our merit. It's never about our worthiness. It's always about God's grace. And no matter what platform you may find yourself on to be able to give a testimony about God, uh, it's not your worthiness that got you there. We have superstars in the Christian faith. We have those people we look to as saying, uh, you know, I go hear them. I, uh, someone was telling me that, uh, that a certain athlete who had been in trouble with the NCAA for about three years showed up here in Houston to get a selfie made with a preacher here in town as part of his penance. Oh, what a great thing. I've been a bad boy for three years. And I'm going to get my picture made with a superstar, and that's going to change me. I don't think so. No, Jesus said that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being dependent, not independent. We're talking about God's worthiness, not ours. We're talking about his grace. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 5, Paul writes, Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are confident in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but that confidence comes from God. Whatever I've become in the kingdom of God, it's not my confidence, it's, it's from God. Look at Saul of Tarsus. Saul was not born in Israel. He was not born in the Holy Land. He was born in Tarsus. He's born over there in the west of there in the Middle East. Saul of Tarsus was the best of believers. He was the master of morality. He lived out every letter of the law. He was a superior student of the Scriptures. He was a dedicated defender of that law, and yet he had to turn and become in order to get into the kingdom. Paul wasn't converted because he obeyed the law. He didn't just get better and better and better and one day find himself blossomed as a believer. He was converted because he realized he could only be saved by grace. That's why he would write in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, that is, grace is the gift of God, through faith, what you believe, like a little child, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, so it puts everybody at the same level. I don't have to be a superior student of Scripture in order to get into the kingdom. I have to be a child. It puts me at the same level. It's not of works so that no one can boast. Saul, the zealot. If there was ever a religiously obnoxious person, it was Paul, Saul. Fulfiller of the law, active, energetic, persecutor of Christians, proud and vigorous and suddenly helpless. If you know anything about the Bible, Acts chapter 9 says Paul was on his way to Damascus with his other uh, buddies, and they were breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. They were the ISIS of their day. They were walking along, thumping their chest, and just daring a Christian to poke his head up where they could get him. And suddenly... That proud and strong man, Saul the zealot, 
found himself on the ground, basically paralyzed. And the man who had taken care of himself all these years and had been patted on the back for being independent and taking care of himself had to have somebody reach down, take him by the hand. He couldn't see, and that person had to lead him back. He couldn't eat. Verse 8 says, Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat and did not drink anything. Now, Paul was a very strong religious individual, and yet he was going in the wrong direction. What has to change? Our sense of sufficiency, our sense of security has to change. Jesus did not say that children have to become adults and have a full knowledge of conversion and have a full knowledge of the Bible and know everything about creation and believe that the earth was created a certain number of days and on and on and on. He didn't say that at all. He said they have to become like a little child. They have to become trusting. They have to trust what they don't know. They have to trust what Jesus can tell them. I was talking with a woman years ago. I had, uh, her son had been brought to church by uh, a bus ministry that we were involved in. The mother didn't come. And the little boy had made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, about nine years of age. And I went to his house to visit with the mother about this. And she said, well, I'm not going to let him be baptized yet. I'm going to wait and see if his life changes. And then I'll let him be baptized. I said, well, what do you mean by having his life change? Well, if he doesn't tell a lie, if he cleans up his room, if he does this, if he does that. I said, by the way, how many years has it been since you've been to church? She said, oh, I don't know, about 20. I said, are you a Christian? Oh, yes. Has your life changed? No. This is not what Jesus said. Jesus said, unless you turn, unless you put your faith in me, Unless you trust me, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Many people thought you have to grow to manhood, adulthood, in order to get in. And Jesus said, no, it's just the opposite. You 12 adults need to go back and become like little children and learn how to trust with a childlike faith. Most of the people I know who do not come into the kingdom of God do not come into the kingdom of God not because of evil deeds they're doing or immorality, They do not come because they simply can't prove everything and they're unwilling to trust anything. So they never make it. A child possesses nothing but needs everything, earns nothing but receives everything as a gift. That's what Jesus said we have to be. Some of you may know the name Bob Buford. Bob Buford was a multi, multi, multi multi-millionaire before 50 years of age. He was over there in East Texas and developed something called a a television cable that you could watch television through. He had a cable company, and, and he just made millions and millions of dollars, and, and he was experiencing a great life until his son drowned in the Rio Grande River. His son, the wealthy, the child of a wealthy man who could do whatever he wanted to, was going down the Rio Grande River and, and drowned. And Bob Buford did everything he could to find him. He hired 41 trackers to search for his son, Ross. He hired airplanes, helicopters, boats, and trackers with dogs, everything that money could buy, but he came to his wit's end, and he said he was standing on a limestone bluff some 200 feet above the water, as frightened as I've ever been, he said, desperate to find my son. And the thought came to him, Bob, here's something you can't dream yourself out of. Here's something you can't think your way out of. Here's something you can't buy your way out of. Here's something you can't work your way out of. This is something you can only trust your way out of. That's what Jesus is saying to these disciples. Getting into the kingdom, the only way you get there is to trust your way in. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. That's very difficult for an adult. 
takes a long time to become a child. Now, what kind of kingdom is one entering? The kingdom in Jesus was talking about, as it is unfolded throughout the New Testament, is, uh, is threefold. There's a kingdom within each person. There's a kingdom around each person. And there's a kingdom beyond each person. So when Jesus says, unless you become like a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom within. He's talking about something that happens inside us where Jesus is king of our life. Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is going to be in your midst. It's going to be with you there. Unless you change, your inner ruler will not change. There are some people who believe in the historical Jesus, but not the Christ of faith. There are some people who take the Bible literally, but never seriously. Unless we turn, change, our inner ruler will not change. Historical Jesus is one we read about and learn about as children, but the Christ of faith is the one we experience as he takes us and sits us down right next to him, just as he did these little children. The Christian faith, the Christian life is about entering into a relationship with the one to whom the Scriptures point. Christian faith is not about arguing arguing the Bible or, or learning all the Bible or being an expert in the Bible. It is coming to know the one the Bible is revealing. So the kingdom's within. The kingdom is around. The kingdom's around where our lives uh, are lived, where our influence comes in this world. Mark 1.15, Jesus said, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And unless we change on the inside, then the influence on the outside never changes. Unless something happens to us and we're converted. Jesus describes himself as the light. John describes Jesus as the light of the world, the bread of life, the way, the truth, and the life. And for the person who has experienced the living Christ, he is the light that leads one out of the darkness. He is the spiritual food that nourishes one every day. And he is the path that leads from death to life. Jesus said you'll never enter that. Unless you change and become like a little child, you won't know what it's like for God to be ruling inside your life. You won't have any idea what kind of influence you should be having in the world. Unless you change and become like a little child. And then he speaks of the kingdom beyond. Paul would write about it this way in Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus says to these disciples, unless you become like this little child and learn how to be dependent on me and learn how to trust in me, you will never enter that kingdom of heaven which is beyond you. The place that you think about, if I leave here, where am I going next? Every civilization that has ever existed in the history of the world has asked that question. What is beyond these kingdoms? And do you know, no matter who the kingdom leader is in this world, eventually one of these days, that one will face that question, what is beyond? Where do I take that next breath when I've taken that last breath here? Luke 23, 42 through 43, when Jesus was being crucified on the cross between two thieves, One said to Jesus, remember me when you come in to give your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise because you have become like a little child and are trusting me. Even in the end of your life, you'll know the kingdom beyond. So Jesus makes it very simple, very plain. To become a part of the kingdom, we need to become like little children. We need to learn to trust and depend in him. Trust his word. Receive him into our lives as our Savior and allow him to bring us into his kingdom. This morning, I'm going to ask you 
this next week to do a number of things. Ask, answer these questions. In what one area of my life do I need to express childlike faith in Jesus? What area? Is it in uh, my personal life? Is it in my marriage? Is it in my business? Where is it that I need to say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you for whatever this is? And second, what one attitude can I change that would give God more kingdom influence in my life? What one attitude? Is it stubbornness? Is it being a cynic? What is it? And number three, what one thing can I change to exert more kingdom influence in my home? How can I let God change me within so that I can help change things without? Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you that knowing you is a simple matter if we'll release all of our pride and our our sense of independence and allow you to come in to take over our lives, to rule within us, to rule around us, to know that one day you'll be ruling beyond us. So this morning I pray for each one here. For those who have yet to receive you as Lord and Savior, they haven't been able to figure it out, I pray they'd turn today and accept it as a matter of grace. We thank you for your goodness to us, We thank you for your salvation in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.